Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. I greet you all with a huge hello and a welcome to uh, this program. I know it's probably been a long Zoom day for most educators, um, or more like a long Zoom year. Um, so I, I do appreciate the fact that you are willing to come and join this presentation also through Zoom. Um, and it, it really shows that as educators, um, those who have been trying to navigate through the, um, the uncertain times that we've lived in, looking at socio-emotional wellness, your own socio-emotional wellness and the socio-emotional wellness of our students is clearly a priority. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I appreciate you being here with us and kind of talking about this important topic. So if we could go to the next slide, we'll dive right into um, the subject matter. The reality is that you know, working through the virtual mediums, working through the uh, type of, of learning that we currently are allowing our students to access um, comes, of course, with its own set of challenges. You know, prior to the pandemic, um, frequently I would travel to different schools, different um, communities to talk about communicating in the classroom, to talk about socio-emotional wellness in the classroom. And never did I imagine that we would come to a time where we now have to talk about communicating and, and promoting socio-emotional wellness from our own homes or from our computer screens or trying to access children and really connect with them on a socio-emotional level while they're behind their own screens and we are behind our own. But you know, as, uh, as you know, teachers and, and educators have shown over and over again, um, resilience is kind of the name of the game. You know, we roll with the punches, we find out you know, what our classroom needs, what our students need. And every year, every new semester, every marking period with every class we teach, we try to adjust. And so this is just another adjustment period in which we're trying to navigate in the best way possible, whether we're teaching in hybrid classrooms, virtual classrooms, or you know, uh, just completely differentiated type of uh, Corona equipped classrooms now. So we went from you know, classrooms that looked very much like the picture on the left-hand side to classrooms that look very much like the picture on the right-hand side. And we really want to understand today how that impacts our students, how it impacts us and what we can do about it. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll see that really one of the key elements of building socio-emotional wellness and enforcing our own socio-emotional wellness comes back to how we communicate and whether or not in our communication style, in our connecting with our students and with others, we are able to convey compassion and receive compassion. Because when we communicate compassionately, we're talking about a two-way street a bi-directional model in which we show our students, we communicate to our students that sense of compassion and empathy and understanding, and they in turn will reciprocate that compassion and empathy and understanding. But it's a bit of a process, and it's a process that sometimes requires um, a lot of our own elements of resilience in order to deliver it. It requires you know, the process of, of building relationships, knowing how to build a relationship through a mediated channel in which we can't see or hear or touch or, or talk in person to our students. Learning how to focus on our nonverbal and verbal cues, even through a screen. Um, learning how to encourage emotional resilience, finding alternative communicative approaches so that we can connect with our students and really understanding the interplay between mental, spiritual, socio-emotional, and relational well-being. And hopefully today, in the short time we have together, we're going to dive into all of these areas and learn how they work together to provide, or how we can bring them together to provide the best atmosphere possible for our students. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that when we talk about socio-emotional wellness, you know, we'll often hear variations, psycho-socio-emotional wellness, um, we'll hear mental wellness, we're, we'll hear the idea of, of a healthy mindset. All of these pieces come together to form more of a holistic well-being. And in order to have a holistic wellness approach as educators, we want to look at the different variables that really contribute to the well-being of a student and to our own well-being as well. So we want to be able to look at the spiritual element, the emotional element, the relational element, the physical and nutritional element, and the mental element. 
And that doesn't mean that in the classroom or as we're teaching behind our screens, we need to be mental health professionals. We need to be um, personal trainers. We need to be uh, uh, interpersonal relationship experts, that we need to be um, those who are, are equipped spiritually to guide our children. We don't need to be each of these or experts in each of these areas. We just need to understand them. And we need to understand that each child will have a different range in how these building blocks of holistic well being, how they interplay within their own lives and the impact that they have in their lives. So, looking at the next slide, we see that the interplay of all of these individual elements kind of ties very closely to a model, um, a sociological model that's known as Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. And that's just a fancy way of saying that for the children that we serve, for the school systems, the educations that make up our uh, system and our place of, of giving and, and, and place of you know, work, there are so many different elements that come together to form that system and so many different elements that impact that system. So when we look at the child as being part of, you know, the center or the core of these different systems, and, you know, this may look a little bit like the solar system project that we have our, our so many of our students do in, uh, in their science classes in elementary or middle school, but really if we were to look at this, you know, somewhat solar system like project, we see that the child is at the center. And the child being at the center exists within a microsystem in which there is direct impact from family, from school, from health services, from the religious organization they attend, maybe from the daycare facility that they attended, the neighborhood playground, of course, not so much right now during Corona, um, their peers, but all of these elements are as, uh, elements of a microsystem that impact the child directly. But there's bigger rings that surround that microsystem. Because if you look at the mesosystem or the exosystem, you begin to see aspects that affect the child, even if they're not directly interacting with them. So a parent who complains to a teacher about you know, something that's going on in the classroom, they've just impacted the child's microsystem, even though they exist in the mesosystem level. A, uh, a parent who complains to the school board, a school board who complains to a teacher, uh, you know, the, the neighbors who get involved in the school system, these would be all part of the exosystem. And we move externally outwards and we see how the macro system affects the child and the chrono system. And what we see today, for example, with the pandemic, when the decisions were made across different school systems about whether schools were going to be hybrid or virtual, whether teachers were gonna go back on site or not go back on site, you know, what implementations would be put in place to protect the children and to protect the teachers, many individuals, teachers and children and parents alike felt like these were happening at the, or these decisions were happening in this external systems, that the chrono system was dictated by the fact that the pandemic existed that the macro system was the ideologies or the attitudes that were being kind of put forth as to how to deal with education during the pandemic. And the exosystem, maybe decisions were being made at the school board. And as teachers, as parents, as children, there may have been this sense of uncertainty, not being able to access those levels. And all of these levels trickle down and affect the child because our attitude will affect how we communicate our response to what's happening at the chrono system, the macro system and the exosystem level will impact what happens in the micro system. So we want to be conscious and cognizant of where we are at in each of those levels and how our response to those levels also impact the child in the micro system. So if we go to the next slide, we take a look at what it means to build emotional resilience within these systems with an understanding of those systems. You know, emotional resilience is sometimes a bit of a catchphrase. You know, we hear it said, you know, we talk about it, but you know, what is emotional resilience? What does that actually look like? So when we look at all those different pieces of the systems that we discussed, we start to see that the impact of the faith and, and the community that connections that a child may have can often be one of the foundational elements of emotional resilience. The interpersonal level or the self-talk of the child, the child who says, you know, I'm going to fail, I stink at this, I don't know how to make my computer work, I can't access anything, has already decreased the level of emotional resilience because of the negative self-talk. 
the interpersonal or dyadic interactions, the child who is sitting in a home who maybe feels lonely, who feels like they're surrounded by family members who are anxious or who are angry or who are causing difficulty, the interpersonal and dyadic within the home is going to impact what's happening within the school as well. The group and the family communication, the societal relations and what's happening outside of the home as well, all of these go hand in hand and require a systems-based approach, meaning we cannot isolate the child and say, well, if the child is having problems, then the problem is within the child without moving externally and really practicing that compassionate communication by looking at the different levels and all of the elements that come together to form that microsystem for the child. So when we move into the next slide, um, we start to see uh, something that traditionally, you know, we, we talk about when we talk about cross-cultural or intercultural communication, um, usually known as the U-curve of culture shock. But interestingly enough, what we've been seeing as an outcome of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic is so many children and teachers as well who are experiencing the U-curve of this new norm. What does that mean? You know, in the very beginning, when the pandemic kind of first hit, when schools were uh, turning to online education, when schools were simply, you know, shutting down or, or providing asynchronous teaching mechanisms rather than synchronous, we started to see children who maybe were a little bit excited. Yes, there was uncertainty and there was fear and there was worry on, you know, one of the exosystem levels in looking externally. But internally, this was something different. It was something new. You know, nobody really knew how long it was going to last for. And very similar to the U curve of intercultural communication, we see that there was a sense of, you know, yay, like it's something different, it's something new. But so many of us as teachers as well began to experience the crisis moments of that U curve, that dip in the U curve, where we begin to question what is going on? How am I going to do this? Where we may have, have had fears fears of our own health, fears for our family members. We may have experienced loss and tragedy. And so the crisis point was hit probably, I wanna say a few weeks into the pandemic. And then as we all began to adjust, you know, adjusting to wearing masks, adjusting to whether it was online or hybrid education, we started to move towards recovery and eventually into that adjustment. But just like we talk about the U curve in intercultural communication, not necessarily being a U, a lot of times what we see is something akin to a W where we might go through this period and we may think we got to the adjustment space, but then we suddenly dip again. And this is something we may have started to see around the November, December timeframe when we weren't quite sure what the winter would hold, when we didn't quite know anything about the vaccines yet, when things were still a big question mark everywhere. So as we process the different form of education, as we process what we're experiencing in the hybrid and the virtual models, recognizing that we will go through a W, not a U curve, and, and helping our students understand that as well, and accepting that part of resilience is understanding what it means to roll with the punches, recognizing that that uncertainty is scary, that fear exists, but we're gonna get through it and we're gonna get through it together. So if we go to the next slide, we start to see some of the, the, the focus, you know, many of you are familiar probably with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which of course has been uh, kind of transformed and readjusted in, in recent years. But when we look at the pandemic and the way that we approached it with our students even, we began at those tertiary levels, looking at the physiological, looking at the safety and security needs. But we began to realize that things were falling apart a little bit at the love belonging level. And students were struggling quite a bit at the self-esteem level. And that that self-actualization was difficult to achieve. And so we often look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs as having one extra level after the self-actualization, which is self-transcendence. And the concept of self-transcendence is that we can go through this entire triangle and our students and ourselves, we still may struggle in terms of socio-emotional wellness. And we may not feel like we are firm in, in having our emotional needs met until we reach that level of self-transcendence, where there is a collective sense of community and a sense that we're not alone. And that's been one of the greatest struggles that we're seeing in the education sphere, particularly in this virtual uh, model of, of feeling alone. 
and to reach self-transcendence, we as educators can connect with our students in very powerful ways. So if we go to the next slide, and also if we can pull up our first poll, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how the polls show up, um, but I think if, uh, if the person who's uh, driving can kind of send out the poll, um, and maybe you guys can give me a, a nod and tell me if you see the poll happening. I'm not sure if it would show up on the screen. Uh, bear with me one second. It's not allowing me to pull it up for some reason. Um, I'm, it, uh, let me see how I can do this. So as you try to figure that out, hopefully we'll get it going. Um, if not though, I'll definitely ask um, those who are in attendance. I know we ask our students to do this all the time to turn their cameras on. I would love to see your faces to kind of feel like, you know, rather than talking to the screen, I'm, I'm talking to you. There you go. I see um, Mr. Ryan just turned his on. Um, I see, that's all I see so far. So I'll, I'll wave back at you. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, there we go. I see another Mr. Ryan just turned it on as well. Thank you. Um, and, and I think this is, this is part of it. You know, we often ask our students, turn on your cameras. Um, and if we're dealing with, with high school students, sometimes you get like that absolute no way, I'm not doing it. But being able to connect with our students by having them, you know, turn on the cameras, getting that visual, trying to make eye contact with them, um, make it a requirement, tell them they've got to, it doesn't matter if they've got messy hair or, you know, if um, uh, their room isn't uh, completely neat, tell them they can use a virtual background to ensure that there isn't sensitivity about the space in which they are interacting from, you know, but find ways that we can connect non-verbally with our students online as well, because we're all trying to make the best of this platform and having that visual can make a difference. Now, I, I don't see my slides anymore, so I don't know if, if you guys are seeing them as well. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I was trying to see if I could get the poll up. Unfortunately, I'm not, I'm, um, not able okay. to pull I up think the poll, but I'll, I'll, I'll verbally ask the questions and the two Mr. Bryans that turn their cameras on can answer. <laughs> and if anyone else wants to turn their camera on um, and then so I could see your smiles as well, that would be wonderful. Um, but you know, the question that I was gonna ask with this slide in the poll was how many teachers, and you can maybe answer this in the chat room, that in the chat box, that might be a little bit easier. Um, how many of you as teachers start your day, the virtual day, um, using a do now activity? And for those of you who may not be familiar with, with the do now concept, the idea of entering the classroom, and maybe it's math class, maybe it's social studies, maybe it's um, you know, uh, trigonometry or, or you know, a class that doesn't necessarily have to do with more of what you think like a liberal arts field, but starting off the day with an exercise that just allows the child to get adjusted. This is an example. So I taught high school for many, many years. Um, and this is an example of you know, something that we'd start as a do now. Um, I see somebody posted something in the chat room. Um, thank you, Natalie. She said she starts with asking the students how they feel and a writing prompt. Um, that's great, you know, just asking, how do you feel? Um, and I know one exercise, sometimes kids, especially if you're teaching first period, first thing in the morning, the last thing they wanna do is start the day off like writing something long. Um, so one exercise you could do is telling them, you know, pick a color that would describe what you're feeling today. And just have everyone, you know, um, one thing we used to do in the classroom was holding up color cards and holding up the color of the card to indicate how you feel. Now more than ever, we need to have those connections with our students. These are questions that I would sometimes use. It might be, if you were a cartoon character, who would you be? And just a simple answer, just a, a response that allows the child to kind of enter into the classroom with a sense of connecting, a sense that it's not just going to be about trigonometry today or English Lit or History 101, that I also want to know about you and you're important and how you feel is important. Questions like, you know, what is one food you'd never want to taste again? Um, if you had a time machine, what time period would you travel to? What award would you love to win and for what achievements? I think that's a question that all of us as educators should probably ask ourselves as well. Because when we try to connect with our students, a lot of times, you know, we need to take that first step of connecting with ourselves as well. In your opinion, which animal flower color is the best or most beautiful and why? And I will tell you, you know, I was teaching uh, uh, seniors in high school. I was teaching, I also taught for many years at the college level. And even at that age, the students felt heard when they were asked these questions. 
they were questions that they wouldn't necessarily be asked. I'm seeing some great responses in the chat box that, you know, discussion of the weekend news on Mondays, um, going over the morning calendar. All of these elements decrease uncertainty avoidance because uncertainty avoidance, which is when we have a high level of wanting to avoid that which is uncertain, can increase anxiety. So when we provide avenues to decrease that anxiety for our students and decrease that uncertainty avoidance, we begin to build greater connections and we begin to communicate more compassionately. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, a, a bit of an introduction of you know, some of the value dimensions that can help us achieve that emotional resilience with our students by better understanding them. And among these value dimensions, you know, I mentioned uncertainty avoidance, and you'll see that's the third one uh, right there in our list. Um, and the concept of uncertainty avoidance, you know, again, we tend to use the term anxiety um, pretty liberally these days. You know, we have a lot of clients who will say, oh, I definitely have anxiety. Um, but rather than self-diagnosing, better understanding anxious feelings, not dismissing them, validating them, recognizing that there are a lot of anxious feelings that so many people are experiencing and our students are all grade levels. And many times those anxious feelings exhibit themselves in psychosomatic ways. So the kindergartner who perpetually has a stomach ache, that could possibly be a result of high uncertainty avoidance and anxious feelings. Um, you know, the, the, the high schooler who is self-harming, that could be also an outcome of high uncertainty avoidance and you know, difficult anxious feelings. So understanding uncertainty avoidance and where we ourselves as educators stand on the uncertainty avoidance scale. Do we have high uncertainty avoidance? Did we panic when we weren't sure what was happening in school the next day? Um, can we roll with the punches, that U curve that we talked about? Um, power distance, understanding that power distance shifts when we're in mediated communication, that it's difficult sometimes to connect with our students at the same level when we've got this online medium there. Now, we could probably go into quite a bit of depth with all of them, but I think, yep, that's fine. Let's go to the next slide, um, just in the interest of time. And I'm hoping that, you know, this is the first of a series of programs. So I'm hoping that we can continue to dive deeper into these aspects as we continue forward. So applying resilience to the classroom, um, it does require us to create a sense of greater security, a sense of being able to decrease that uncertainty avoidance by doing things like maybe discussing the news in a positive way or in a way in which they can, our students can understand. Um, one of the uh, comments in the chat box was starting with the problem of the day and reflecting on the best part of the weekend. This is another way to create a sense of security. Um, providing empathy-oriented approaches rather than directly action-oriented, meaning the child who comes in and says, you know what, I didn't do my report, and this is a huge report, and you've been telling them about the report for ages, and you're seeing them on the Zoom classroom, and you're like, where's your report? And they're like, I didn't do it. Knowing how to respond with empathy as the first response. Asking why. What is it? Let's talk after school. You know, Let's take a couple of minutes, and I know as educators that that those couple of minutes sometimes multiply them by 20 or 30 kids in the classroom and it can be exhausting but it will have that emotional reward of being able to connect with our students um, having those parental partnerships and understanding how to implement differentials for different students even in the online classroom All right so if we go to the next slide We'll take a quick look at um, something that, again, I think from your uh, teaching certification days, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the VARC learning system, the different comprehension styles, understanding that some students are visual and some students will learn from being able to see things. Some are oral and it's all about hearing. Some are, uh, learn better in the reading writing style, some are kinesthetic. So getting that movement in, even when you're online, asking them to get up out of their seat when they've been looking at Zoom sessions one after the other, um, recognizing that the different students in, in each of those little boxes on the Zoom screen are going to have different needs and trying to be able to adjust as, as needed. Okay. So I'm not sure what happened to my screen. Um, okay, there we go, we're back. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I. I want us to touch on, on how we communicate and how do we communicate across computers because we often think it's common sense, but actually requires quite a bit of strategy. So we go to the next slide. Um, we'll see this, this image that, um, you know, 
verbal communication is said to make up 35% or less in terms of how we comprehend and how we respond to that which people are communicating to us. Nonverbal communication is said to make 65%, make up 65% or more of how we interpret responses. Now, if we go to the next slide, we can take a look at what we tend to see, right? We've got a Zoom classroom up. And maybe we don't see the head on, you know, maybe we see something more like this, you know, in, in the Zoom classroom with our students. But, you know, as we're looking at these images here, I had another poll, but since we can't pull up the polls right now, we'll just kind of ask that uh, in the chat room again, you can respond. Which of these images looks to you like a face that is resiliently responsive, meaning a face that is processing the information and responding in a positive way to the information that's being processed? You can just, you can unmute yourself and shout it out or you can type your guess in the chat box. I don't feel like any of these look positively responsive. Okay. Maybe number three. Okay. All right. So number three is as close as it gets for you as you're processing it, right? Anyone else? Any other guesses? I also think three. Okay, you also think three, good. Okay, somebody said maybe number eight. Okay, good, good. Okay, so good guesses. Um, as we're looking at this particular face here, number three is ranked as the most resiliently responsive. And it's not a huge smile on the face. It's not, and, and obviously it's not a video, so we can't see any nodding. But what we see is a slight tilt to the forehead forward. We see the chin tucked under slightly, and we see the muscles by the facial muscles by the mouth slightly turned upwards. I want you to think of your sixth grade students, seventh grade students, ninth grade students, 10th grade students, 11th grade students, and think about their facial expressions. And the fact that sometimes it is such a slight, almost imperceptible nonverbal cue that can give us an indication or a window into what they're thinking. We're not likely to see huge smiles and grins. Occasionally we do. And those are the moments where as teachers we're like, yes, you know, they got it. They, they're, they're getting it. But a lot of times it's a lot less perceptible, particularly through the mediated communication of being online. So when we catch something as small as that forehead tilted forward, the chin tucked down and the slight upper movement of the muscles on, on the bottom half of the face, know that this is a positive reaction. Whereas if you look at number eight, for example, you'll see that the head is tilted sideways. The lift is only on one side towards the left side. And so it begins to, to show a bit more like either a sarcastic look or a, oh, I know this already. Um, and again, this is something hopefully in future sessions we can dive into a bit more understanding the muscle structure and the slight indications that nonverbal cues can give us when we're um, teaching. All right, if we go to the next slide, um, we see what we're missing in a lot of the, the, the nonverbals as we're teaching online. We no longer have the benefit of haptics and haptics of course has to do with touch and you know what's happening with the children's hands. How are they connecting? Are they leaning over towards one another to talk? Um, we don't have the benefit of proxemics, you know, um, standing closer to the student as they're working to try to guide them towards something, being able to lean forward as we're teaching certain movements in our stances. We can't convey that online, um, but we can convey our vocal variety. We can indicate, you know, increase the volume of our voice. We can make the pitch of our voice a little higher. We can drop the voice octaves a little bit lower when we want to really enunciate or focus on something. We can work with our pauses. We can work with the different vocal variety. And that's, those are our tools. Our toolbox is limited online, but those are some of them. Our emotional cues, being able to indicate by mirroring expressions. So if we were to see that face, that the forehead leans slightly, the chin back, if our response is a wider smile, our response is an expression that mirrors what we're seeing, but increases it, often we'll see that the child or the student reciprocates that mirroring of the expression. And this is how we begin to break through the barriers. So if we go to the next slide, 
we talk a little bit about spare brain time. You know, as I'm speaking here and as I'm looking at our, our um, room of, of the educators who are with us, um, I know that as I'm talking, our brains are moving at such a rapid pace, right? So as the human voice can speak kind of, we normally speak between 125 to 150 words per minute. Um, since I'm, uh, you know, from the, the Northeast and we tend to speak even faster, I might be like on the 160 word per minute mark. Um, but generally speaking, we're in that range. But the brain can process 500 words per minute. So what winds up happening is that our students have spare brain time. The remainder of, of that time in which the brain is not processing the words that are being spoken, it's processing what do I want to eat for lunch? Where am I gonna go on this weekend? Um, oh, what's that kid doing in that screen over there? Um, you know, uh, it's funny that I see that, that in the image, right? And so in order to ensure that we utilize the spare brain time of our students, we want to make sure that as much as we can in that virtual realm, we are connecting, we are communicating, we're using our hands, we're using our facial cues so that the, the brain time on their end requires more processing than just the words. Because if I were to become monotonous and I were just to speak in this voice for the entire hour of the classroom, I would think that I would lose everyone. So you want to make sure that you keep that engaging style and that is another way of communicating compassionately. Now, if we move forward to the next slide, um, this was another poll that we were gonna do, um, but since we can't do it now, again, I'll just ask uh, uh, quickly. Um, if I say the word tree, I want you to tell me what tree comes to your mind. What's the tree that you think of? I said tree, what type of tree do you think of? And uh, Ms. Fatima, since I see you in the screen, I'm gonna ask you first, what tree would you think of when I say the word tree? We have a nice uh, oak tree in our backyard. Okay, so you thought of oak tree. So yeah. I'm gonna ask the two Brian's who I can't really see on my list anymore, but <laughs> I know you're there. So <laughs> what tree would you think of when I say tree? I picture an evergreen. Okay, you picture an evergreen. How I picture a pawpaw. Paw. What kind? Pawpaw, P-A-W-P-A-W. -W. It's, okay. it's a native Northeastern tree. Okay, that's awesome. I have no idea what that looks like, but that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, so just looking at three different educators, right? I said the word tree. I have to be honest, I was thinking of a palm tree. Like I'm looking at the snow outside and I'm so done with the winter. And I'm like, I said tree, I thought palm tree. But Ms. Fatima thought oak tree because she's got an oak tree in her backyard. Um, Mr. Brian thought of a pawpaw tree, which I'm not quite sure I know what that is. Um, the other Mr. Brian thought of an evergreen tree. So three different educators or four different educators and all of us thought of a different tree. And so when we're communicating with our students, particularly online, we may be saying something, we may be verbalizing something and the way that it is processed is completely different because our experiences shape the way that we communicate and the way that our students process that communication is through their lens and their experiences. So I'm going to quickly go through a couple of the last slides just because I do wanna make sure we have some time for Q and A. Um, but as teachers, I know that you're feeling the strain. You know, this isn't even a question. I know that it has been a very, very heavy year in so many different ways. And it's important that you also take that time for yourself to be compassionate towards yourself as well, that you recognize that it's, it's not an easy job to be an educator. And it's definitely not an easy job during this pandemic to be an educator who has to juggle so much. But being compassionate, showing empathy, promoting socio-emotional wellness first within you and then with your students, that makes a huge difference. So if we go to the next slide, one of the ways that we can do that is by practicing planned abandonment and really focusing on positive mindfulness. Planned abandonment is actually a bit of a business theory um, in which uh, Peter Drucker, who uh, kind of studied sales and, and what worked and didn't work, talked about how in a, in a store, for example, that had lots of merchandise, they should put things on sale before they needed to clear them out because that would help in clearing the inventory in, in a more productive way. So we have to practice planned abandonment too. I can't tell you how excited you know, my little one is, for example, my youngest daughter, um, when her teachers end class five minutes early in the Zoom classroom. She's on cloud nine, she comes running down and she's so excited and like, they let us out five minutes early. That, that's planned abandonment. Rather than waiting for the child to be burnt out, rather than waiting for yourself to be burnt out, building in that time where you might say, okay, Thursday of this week, 
I am going to end class, you know, 7.5 minutes early or the last six minutes of class, I'm going to let the kids, you know, just color or I'm going to ask them a question like, you know, if you were a cartoon character, what cartoon character would you be? And I promise you it's okay. I promise you they will learn their algebra and they will learn their trigonometry lesson and they will learn the English lit that they need to learn. But that planned abandonment will really help in promoting that positive mindset. If we go to the next slide, we also see you know, the importance of breathing, taking those breaks, asking your students to get up out of your seat and modeling the action. So don't just ask your students to get up out of their seat, but you get out as well. Teach them how to take those H breaths, where it's a, a deep inhalation and then breathing outwards, making that H sound as they're feeling it on the palm of their hands. This is the time to teach our students and to implement for ourselves positive socio-emotional mechanisms that are gonna help in every walk of life. And then finally, learning grounding techniques and teaching these grounding methods to our students as well. The 54321 method is a simple method that really helps in different situations, particularly with that high uncertainty avoidance. Asking your students to identify five things that they can see. Asking them to identify four things they can touch. So starting maybe with pressure points, putting the fingers against each other and pushing as hard as they can and feeling the tension that, that may exist within them being pushed out. Um, doing fist exercises where they're holding their fingertips and saying, I feel my fingertips against the palm of my hands and then releasing that negative energy externally. Three things that they can smell and practicing that deep breathing as they can inhale and smell. Two things that they can hear. And finally, one thing they can taste. And often when I do this exercise with my clients or when I used to do it with students, I'd always have a bag of warhead candies or sour patch or in absence of that, um, a little bit of chili pepper flakes. Something that really causes the brain synapses, that causes the negative energy and the negative thoughts to be halted. And as you place that warhead or that sour patch candy on your tongue, really allowing your body and your mind to process what it is that you're tasting. And this isn't an exercise just for children. It's an exercise for us as adults as well. And then turning to that which grounds us. If it's our faith that grounds us and that helps us move forward, incorporating moments throughout our day in which we turn to our faith. If it's a certain you know, form of music, a certain type of, of, of uh, a distraction that helps us through the difficulties, turning to that and incorporating that in our days. And finally, we'll go to the last slide. Um, you know, what does it really look like or feel like to achieve socio-emotional wellness? You know, I used to share this story with a lot of my students um, about the egg, the carrot, and the coffee bean which was a story about, you know, I believe it was shared on social media a while ago, um, that if you had a pot of boiling water and if you place the carrot in it, the carrot, which was once hard and strong and, and you know, resilient, becomes mushy. It turns into, into a horrible mushy mess in that boiling water. If you take an egg and place it in the boiling water, it's hard external, you know, shell remains hard, but inside its softness also turns hard. And so it changes. But if you take a coffee bean and you place it in the boiling water, the coffee bean doesn't change, but it changes the water around it and it makes coffee. And so one way that we can know that we've achieved that socio-emotional wellness is if we are like the coffee bean. If we're able to recognize the difficulty of the circumstances around us, we're able to recognize the boiling water we're in, and rather than allowing the boiling water to change us, we change that boiling water and we find joy and strength and contentment and confidence and even empowerment within that pot of boiling water. So the last few slides that are here in this presentation are just resources, resources for you as teachers, resources you can share with your students. Um, there's so many of them. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely helpful and beneficial to know where we can turn to, where we can turn to to learn more about socio-emotional wellness, about our emotional IQ, um, about mental health and, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Dr. Susie. This is very um, enlightening and you know, covering a very important topic for us. Uh, so let's start with some Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, please submit them in writing um, and we'll, we'll take them. So maybe I'll, I'll start off with the first question. So if we to consider the perspective of the child in the classroom and you know, recognizing that different age groups are going to have different needs and wants. You know, let's think about things from an elementary child perspective, from a middle school child perspective, and from a high school child perspective. 
for each of those groups, what would be one thing or one need that the student might express? If there's one thing that they'd like to have their teacher do differently in terms of their style, what would that be for the, middle, for the elementary school student, the middle school student, and for the high school student? So I think that's that's a great question. Um, and even though you know we we might think that it's a different need in each of those grade levels, realistically speaking, if we're seeking out socio-emotional wellness, there is one constant need that is needed in children that are as young as you know three, four, five years old, and in adults that are as old as you know 80, 90, 100 even. And that need is to be heard and to be seen. Because one of the greatest struggles that we're seeing, especially throughout this pandemic, is the sense of immense loneliness that is really our, our youngest students are feeling it and our oldest community members are feeling it as well. So being seen and being heard. And that takes little, small, often nonverbal cues or small verbal cues that can make a difference in a child's life. So the elementary school students who, when entering the Zoom classrooms, the teacher responds and says, hey, Mike, it's so nice to see you. Or hello, Amina, I'm so glad that you're here today. That moment of being seen and heard, it makes a difference for the, you know, the third grader and it makes a difference for the 12th grader. Identifying, for example, a high school student and saying, hey, you know, Muhammad, you look a little under the weather today. Are you feeling okay? That in itself provides validation. It provides empathy. It provides compassion and it creates an instant connection. And I know you might be thinking, I've got 22 students in my Zoom classroom. How am I going to do that? Pick a different handful of students every day. Write it in your uh, agenda. I talked to, you know, Jen, Mike, Amina, and Mohammed today. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk to, you know, Natalie and, and Ethan and, uh, you know, uh, Amir and, uh, you know, Mona. And make that list. But make sure that your children, your students are seen and they're heard. Because that makes a difference at any age level. Great, thank you. So, you know, with respect to relationships and technology, so relationships is one thing in the classroom, but in the virtual environment, you know, it's a completely different ball game. What should the teacher be doing in terms of trying to promote those relationships, whether that be, you know, using certain technology, using other technologies? What's the best way to, to build relationships in that virtual classroom? As we've all been there over the past year of uh, having one of those can you hear me moments or you know you're on mute you're on mute right so a lot of times technology unfortunately fails us you know as today i thought it was all ready and, and set to go and that i couldn't get my my slides up on the screen um so as much as we may think that using technology using you know the polls using the, the systems that we have online are are the best way they're not the only way of connecting with our students um so I would say again, like a lot of it has to do with the verbals and the nonverbals. Connecting with a student by saying something like, hey guys, you know, I'm I'm actually in my office in my house right now. Let me show you what I have on the wall. You know? and, and humanizing what you're doing in that moment. Maybe that's too personal and you don't want the kids to know what's on your wall. Bringing in something, you know, saying something like, hey, you know, I always keep this item on my desk. And, you know, this is, it's a stress ball and it actually helps me to relieve the stress but humanizing what you're doing, asking the students maybe to show one thing that's important to them and to lift it up on the screen. Again, it works at every age level. We often think of show and tell as being you know, a kindergarten activity, but again, in the, in the process of being seen and heard, even our oldest students want those moments where they can feel validated and, and they can feel important and you show them that you're interested in something more than just their grades or more than just the results of their test. Thank you. Um, regarding engagement in the classroom, and you talked a little bit about, you talked a lot about this actually, but you know, in terms of engagement, should the teacher be trying to get 100% engagement? You know, should that be the goal? Um, and if so, how do you go about achieving that 100% engagement? So we often talk about the 80-20 rule, uh, Pareto's principle, right? you want to get you know, at least 80% of your audience relatively interested. 20%, either 10% of them are already interested and they're the students who are already eager and they've got pen in hand and, and paper in front of them. And 10% you've already lost before you've even begun. 
And sometimes it's because of something that's happening in the, the meso system or in the chrono system or the exo system. It might not even be something in the classroom. So I would say as a teacher, especially ma managing the Zoom classrooms, tackle it week by week, you know, set yourself some goals. Let yourself know that again, I'm going to focus on ensuring that these six students are super engaged in today's lesson. And then tomorrow I'm gonna to focus on these six students. And then the next day, I'm gonna focus on these six students. And maybe those are the moments in which you're targeting specifically that you want to engage those specific students. But generally speaking, if you've got 80% of your audience turning their cameras on, nodding, we have less than 80% with cameras on today, but you know, hopefully we've got engagement going on in, in the background, even if we can't see it. But if you can get 80% engaged, then know that those 20%, you'll tackle them throughout the week or in other ways. Thank you again, very useful advice. So um, does anybody um, in the call today have a question maybe that they even like to ask, um, you know, verbally? Okay. If not, I, I will ask maybe, you know, just one last question. Um, regarding problem areas, um, you know, teachers, you know, we know how to spot problem areas when you're in the physical classroom. Um, how do we look after and care for the students in the virtual environment? You know, how do you spot you know, potential problems that the, the students might be having? How can a teacher help and assist um, you know, when, it's, you know, when you've got a large number of people in a virtual environment, you, know, you can't see everybody in the same level of detail as you would see in, in a physical uh, classroom. What should, we, what should the teaching profession be looking out for? I think, you know, um, some of you put in some really great points in the chat box about things that you do that are outside of just the, the, the lesson plan for that day, you know, asking those questions of how do you feel, um, looking for certain signs. And like I said, if you need to tackle it in pieces where you tell yourself, I'm going to concentrate on, you know, the, the students who have last names from A to H on this day, and then I'm going to concentrate on the students who have last names from F to whatever on this day, Give yourself manageable chunks. You know, we often talk about chunking as a technique when we're looking at time management, but chunking can also be a technique in classroom management. Don't try to tackle, you know, all 100% of students all the time, but do make sure that by the end of the week, you've been able to give a certain amount of attention to each student and have that, that open door policy to a certain extent. Again, respecting your own time and respecting your boundaries because you need to take care of yourself as an educator as well. But maybe knowing that every Wednesday you've got office hours for an hour, but rather than just opening it up and saying, hey guys, I have office hours for an hour on Wednesdays, because you know most students are not gonna show up if they don't have to, um, giving a little incentive saying, hey, whoever pops into my office hour on Wednesday um, you know, gets extra credit or I have office hours for you know, you know, the people with the last names A through H this Wednesday and next Wednesday, I've got it for this and this. So you're creating more manageable chunks that you're able to pay attention to. And you know, like they always say in the Air Force, if you see something, say something. If you see an indication that a child is, you know, responding in a way that doesn't seem to be in line with what you normally see, even if it is in a Zoom classroom, even if it's in a hybrid setting, try to pick up on those cues. And, and you can tell, you know, the expression on the face, whether or not the head is down, the nonverbal cues that they're giving. And again, this is why turning on the cameras is so important um, whenever it's possible. But pick up on those. And maybe those are the students that you're going to send a personal invitation for to come to those office hours. And you'll speak to them one on one at that time. Uh, I had a quick question. Thank you, Dr. Susie. So. I think with that, we will conclude today's session. I'd like to thank Dr. Susie for this very important um, webinar. I'd like to thank all of the participants for you know, participating today and the engagement and you know, contributions to, to the discussion. Um, as Dr. Susie mentioned, this will be the first in a series of additional webinars that will follow. So keep your eye out and uh, you know, we'll have more details coming out on, on additional webinars uh, in the near future. Uh, so that, with that, we'll conclude. And again, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for participating in this important session. Okay, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.